This conference will now be recorded. Good morning and welcome to our Alaska Collaborative on Health and the Environment teleconference on breast cancer prevention beyond pink ribbons. Today we are joined by three amazing leaders in breast cancer prevention. Karuna Jagger of Breast Cancer Action, Janet Ackerman of Silent Spring Institute, and Connie Engel of the Breast Cancer Fund. They will discuss environmental risk factors and the precautionary principle, the science linking exposures to toxic chemicals and breast cancer, and ways to prioritize prevention through individual and collective action. My name is Diana DeFazio, and on behalf of Alaska Community Action on Toxics, I'll be facilitating today's call. CHE Alaska is a regional partnership group of the National Collaborative on Health and the Environment. CHE Alaska aims to advance knowledge and effective action to address growing concerns about the links between human health and environmental factors. You can find more information online at akaction.org and at healthandenvironment.org. The call will last one hour and we'll have time at the end for your questions. Last night, I sent a link to our speakers' presentations to everyone who had signed up for the call by then. If you haven't done so already, please take a moment to download the presentations, which can also be found by going to our homepage at akaction.org and looking in the left-hand column. All three of the presentations have been combined into a single PDF document, which our speakers will be referencing by slide number. You may want to access Connie's animated version of her presentation separately. It's pretty cool. Um, it's a Prezi presentation. I included that link in the email that I sent out last night, and she will be presenting last. So um, it would be great to get those things up and ready because we will be getting started soon. Now it is my pleasure to welcome and introduce our speakers. We're thrilled to have Karuna Jagger, Janet Ackerman, and Connie Engel on our call today. Each of these women brings their own expertise and passion to their work to prevent breast cancer. And we're extremely honored that Karuna, Janet, and Connie will be in Alaska next week, speaking at events in Anchorage, Bethel, Homer, and Juneau. You can find full event times and locations on our website at akaction.org. I'd like to go ahead and introduce all three of our speakers now in the order that they will be presenting. Karina Jagger is Executive Director of Breast Cancer Action, an organization that carries the voices of people affected by breast cancer to inspire and compel the changes necessary to end the breast cancer epidemic. Recognizing that social injustices and environmental factors put each of us at risk of developing breast cancer, regardless of family medical history, Karuna insists that personal lifestyle choices will not protect us from breast cancer. As Breast Cancer Action's Executive Director, Karuna's vision for health equity awards every woman affected by breast cancer the power and knowledge to make informed decisions that enable them to take control of their health care. This includes a woman's right to access affordable treatment options, to create individualized treatment plans that reflect personal values and priorities, and to avoid involuntary exposure to environmental toxins. Our, spec our second speaker will be Janet Ackerman, staff scientist at the Silent Spring Institute. And the Silent Spring Institute is dedicated to innovative science investigating the links between environment and women's health, especially breast cancer. Janet's current research focuses on developing high throughput chemical testing methods relevant to breast cancer and identifying the best methods for measuring mammary carcinogens in people's bodies. Since joining Silent Spring Institute in 2010, Janet has also contributed to research on the impact of early life exposures on breast development and breast cancer risk, reducing exposures to endocrine disruptors from food packaging, and characterizing groundwater pollution from endocrine disrupting, disruptors in wastewater. Excuse me. Our final speaker will be Connie Engel. Connie is Science and Education Manager at the Breast Cancer Fund. The Breast Cancer Fund works to prevent breast cancer by eliminating our exposure to toxic chemicals and radiation linked to the disease. Connie's work focuses on translating science to policymakers and the public, and she has created programs that use cutting edge technology to explore and explain the science and policy around breast cancer and the environment. Welcome to each of you. Karuna, would you like to go ahead and begin? Well, thank you so much. Um, I'm really honored to be part of this panel on a topic that is so important to many of us. It's really wonderful to join these incredible researchers and activists, and I want to thank the CHE group and the great folks at ACAP for the opportunity to be part of this event. So I recognize that each of us has a very different relationship to breast cancer, and I want to begin by grounding today's conversation with important statistics. Uh, you can join me on slide two. Breast cancer affects a lot of people, 
women, their families, communities, ultimately our entire society. This is the most common cancer among women in the United States besides skin cancer, and it accounts for nearly one in three cancers diagnosed in American women. Only lung cancer accounts for more cancer deaths in women. As I move to slide three, I want to ask you to pause with me and reflect on what it means that each and every year, more than 230,000 women are diagnosed with invasive breast cancer. And on top of that, we can add another 2,000 or more men. Approximately 40,000 women die each year from breast cancer. And in addition, we can add another 60,000 women who are diagnosed with and treated for non-invasive ductal carcinoma in situ. And while there's good debate about whether this is in fact cancer, the key point for our purposes is that women with DCAS are generally treated for cancer, including full mastectomies at times. Um, and so they bear, uh, they, they have the experience of breast cancer. Chances are everyone on this call knows someone who is affected by breast cancer, ourselves, our loved ones. And today, more than two and a half million women in the United States are estimated to have been treated for breast cancer. So as we move to slide four, I want to take time here to recognize that breast cancer impacts different communities in very different ways. Breast cancer is unlike most diseases in that white, middle, and upper class women actually have the highest incidence. And this is different from things like diabetes and lung cancer. Despite the fact that women of color are less likely to be diagnosed with breast cancer, they're more likely to die of their disease. They experience worse morbidity and worse mortality and are often diagnosed at younger ages with more aggressive forms of breast cancer. And so I want to take some time here to talk about these disparities in breast cancer, but make sure that we are grounding these disparities in the deep social and economic inequities that, that produce the disparities. Um, this provides an important foundation and starting point for a conversation that we're going to have today on this teleconference about breast cancer and the environment. The Center for Disease Control, the CDC, reports that white women have the highest incidence of breast cancer, followed by black women and then Hispanic women, with American Indian and Alaska Native women having the lowest incidence of breast cancer. That said, we should always remember that there are important differences within any larger racial and ethnic aggregate groups. And so, for example, we can see that with uh, Asian Pacific Islander data, um, certain subgroups, such as Hawaiian women, have significantly higher incidence than other subgroups. In addition, there are important geographic differences in different parts of the country. And for instance, you know, very relevant to, to this conversation today and, and to next week's panel, uh, breast cancer rates are highest in Alaska, where Native women have rates similar to those of white women. Indeed, breast cancer is the most common cancer for American Indian Native, excuse me, Alaska Natives, representing 28% of all cancers. Now, American Indians and Alaska Natives suffer from multiple health disparities compared with the general population. And, uh, you know, as I noted at the beginning of this slide, I want to remind you that the chances of surviving breast cancer correlate strongly with race and ethnicity. You can see on the screen that black women are on average about 40% more likely to die of their disease than white women with breast cancer. Latina women are 20% more likely to die of breast cancer than white women on average. Even when researchers control for income and health insurance, that is access to care, they find that race and ethnicity are strongly correlated with a woman's chance of surviving breast cancer. Women of color are also more vulnerable to breast cancer-related financial declines. So these might be drop in earnings and joblessness after treatment for breast cancer. The American Public Health Association recently reported these findings, which are statistically significant, again, even once researchers adjust for income, education, and employment. And so the point here is that there are long-reaching effects of a breast cancer diagnosis, uh, diagnosis and that different groups are at higher risk for these long-lasting, far-reaching effects. And I want to pause here to address common concerns that it's mammography screening rates that account for some of these differences. So this, many times folks will argue um, <clears throat> that women of color have less access to mammography screening and that produces the different outcomes. But for better or worse, after decades of focus on awareness and screening to promote early detection, today's screening rates are remarkably similar 
um, among women of different races and ethnicities, so that screening rates alone cannot account for these differences in death rates. We need to look at differences in treatments and differences in exposures, these gene-environment interactions. And as we move to slide five, um, you know, I want to, we will be talking further in the presentation about the fact that breast cancer is a complex disease with complex causes that develops over the course of a lifetime. And, you know, there has been some concern that focusing on breast cancer in some way takes away from other diseases. Uh, what we're arguing is that there's a lot to learn about public health from breast cancer. This is not to say that breast cancer is more important than other diseases and disorders. Instead, I'm arguing that by addressing the root causes of breast cancer, we will address the root causes of a whole host of other public health problems. And, you know, to this point, it's worth noting that the growing incidence of breast cancer is has been accompanied by rising incidence of childhood cancers and a host of other public health concerns. Um, what is good for breast health is, is good for our overall health. So where are we today? You cannot say breast cancer without someone mentioning a pink ribbon, which is, I've shown here on slide six. Um, there is a lot to say about the pink ribbon. It's been a controversial symbol with an interesting history, and you can learn more about that on the Breast Cancer Action website. But I bring us to the pink ribbon today because it has dominated the conversation in the mainstream breast cancer movement. And today, by focusing on breast cancer and environment, we are implicitly um, pointing to the shortcomings of pink ribbon awareness and mammography screening. So for many years, the pink ribbon symbol has been accompanied by the claim that early detection is your best prevention. But of course, mammograms don't prevent breast cancer. They find it after it has already developed. And later in the conversation, Connie is going to talk about the risks of radiation exposure through medical imaging, including mammograms, particularly for some populations. Today, there is still the widespread insistence that early detection saves lives. And without turning this into a webinar on screening, we have seen the limits of early detection. And it is clear that mammograms don't prevent cancer. And unfortunately, they don't save as many lives as promised despite more than 30 years of awareness and widespread mammography access, we are simply not seeing the promised results. Um, as I, here we are in slide seven, and in addition to the 30-year-plus focus on mammography screening, women are told to prevent their cancer through a variety of lifestyle tips. But women are essentially told it's their job to prevent their own cancer. And yet, it's important that we all recognize that even women who supposedly do all the right things still get and die from breast cancer. Many of the known risk factors for breast cancer are non-modifiable. So for example, women themselves cannot control the age that they start and stop their periods. Um, so women are told to stay fit and avoid weight gain to reduce the risk of breast cancer. And yet, the very researchers who uh, produce these materials um, for example, the 2011 Institute of Medicine report on breast cancer and environment, those researchers have acknowledged that even if an individual woman follows all of the recommended tips, the researchers cannot assure her that she will actually lower her own individual risk. And so on the other hand, we, there's an important body of evidence linking chemical exposures to breast cancer, carcinogens in our air and homes, hormone disruptors in our food packaging and personal care products. And this is, of course, the focus of the second half of the conversation. And so by limiting the conversations about breast cancer prevention to lifestyle, we appear to be blaming women for their own cancers and telling them that if they didn't do all the right things, it must be their fault that they got cancer. Um, so let's turn to slide eight and talk a little more about known causes of breast cancer. The fact is we still have a lot to learn about the root causes of breast cancer. What we uh, know accounts for less than half of all breast cancers, and I've listed here some commonly uh, referred to risk factors. In the interest of time, I'm not going to talk about all of them, but I just want to highlight a few. Um, the first thing that many people think about is the BRCA genes. These are the genes that all of us carry, but when mutated in certain families can dramatically increase the risk of breast and ovarian cancer. These mutations account for less than 10% of all breast cancers, and uh, only about 1 in 600 women are affected by a BRCA mutation. Um, many of these other factors that you can see listed are not modifiable, as I noted earlier. That is, we cannot control how tall we are or, uh, you know, our own weight as a baby, our own birth weight. Furthermore, each of these things alone generally represents a very small increased risk. 
the fact remains that being a woman and aging, and you know, let us all be so lucky uh, to age well, is the greatest factor for breast cancer risk. And so today, as you see here on slide nine, we cannot explain more than half of all breast cancers. But we do know here on the cartoon on slide 10 that there is a growing body of evidence on the environmental links to breast cancer. Chemicals that we are exposed to in our daily lives over the course of our lives. So Janet is going to be talking about what we know and what we don't yet know about the root causes of breast cancer. And Connie will discuss what we can do with this information. I want to set the stage. I flipped now to slide 11 by talking about chemicals and consumer products. Many of us have heard these stats that there are well over 80,000 chemicals in commercial use today. These chemicals, which are used in everything from toys to shower curtains to furniture, are regulated by the 1976 Toxic Substance Control Act, referred to as TSCA. Not only is this law out of date, uh, but the majority of these chemicals, and Connie's going to talk about things we can do to update TSCA and other um, regulatory laws, but the majority of the chemicals regulated through TSCA, about 60,000 were grandfathered in at the time the law passed. And they've never been safety tested, all but, but 200 have never been safety tested. Um, some of the uses today, we can say that, you know, some uses of only five of these um, chemical uses have been restricted. Put things in perspective, which is fairly shocking to most folks, the Environmental Protection Agency tried to use TSCA to restrict asbestos about 20 years ago and failed. So if we can't regulate asbestos through TSCA, you can see that we have some work to do to strengthen this law. And again, um, Connie will bring us to that at the end, as well as other important laws. But I mention this simply to ground us and in the fact that we just don't know very little about the safety of most of the chemicals that are used in the products that we buy and use every day. So as I flip to slide 12, um, this is important context in terms of rising cancer rates more broadly. So where once environmental links to cancer were in dispute, these links are increasingly widely recognized. And you can see on slide 12 here a quote from the President's Cancer Panel that was released in, uh, I think it was released in 2011, which pointed to the role of environmental exposures to chemicals in a range of cancers, including and not limited to breast cancer. This report signaled an alarm and an urgent call to action. Um, as I turn back to breast cancer here on slide 13, we can see that the chance that a woman will develop the disease over the course of her lifetime has been steadily increasing over the decades. So in 1964, a woman's lifetime risk of breast cancer, that is, she lived about age 75, was 1 in 20. By 1984, it was 1 in 14. And today, it's 1 in 8. Now, as you can see, I'm moving quickly because we have a lot to cover. but. Um, it's worth noting that many environmental health activists have noted that these trends in breast cancer incidents all of, also follow the widespread use of chemicals um, in household products that have never been safety tested. So here on slide 14, while there have been some advances in treatment, too many women continue to die of breast cancer. And it's estimated that up to 30% of initial breast cancer diagnoses will metastasize. Um, sometimes, you know, a year, three years, five years, and sometimes 20 years later. No matter how long a woman lives after a breast cancer diagnosis, and I do hope that it's many years, her body, her finances, her psyche, her relationships for a lifelong and lasting toll of this disease. We need true primary prevention, and we need to address this public health crisis at its roots. And as we get ready to turn to Janet's and Connie's Janet and Connie's presentations, I want to spend a few minutes here on slide 15 laying out some principles for action. The first is the precautionary principle. This is the commitment to prevent harm before it occurs. It's kind of a fancy way of saying better safe than sorry. Now, Janet's going to talk about um, all that we still have to learn about the health effects of many chemicals, but we should never let gaps in knowledge stop us from taking action to protect our health now. We must act on the weight of the evidence. And we need to demand that manufacturers prove product safety before bringing them to market. We cannot protect public health so long as we consider chemicals innocent and, and therefore assume that they are safe. 
um, until and unless they can be proven harmful. And as we push ourselves and others to take action based on the weight of the evidence, here on slide uh, 16, I want to caution against putting the burden only on individual people. Consumer activism is a widespread strategy, and while many see it as a gateway to larger change, I think it's very important that we take some minutes to discuss the limits of this strategy. First of all, the strategy only works with chemicals that we know the most about. So BPA is a common example, and Connie will talk later about the replacements, which it turns out are also estrogenic. This leaves tens of thousands of chemicals that we simply don't have as much information about on the shelves and in our homes and in our bodies. And of course, we are exposed to multiple chemicals throughout our lives, in our schools, parks, places of work, and no amount of consumer diligence will keep us safe from chemicals that we don't have control over. Even if we ourselves drive an electric car, we're still exposed to the auto exhaust of the rest of the drivers, and auto exhaust is linked to breast cancer. Um, a recent Silent Spring study came out a week or so ago um, highlighting this, this issue. This also puts an unfair burden on consumers. Uh, we're not just asking people to remember high school science, but essentially to become experts in toxicology and chemistry, knowing the multiple names of chemicals, uh, you know, in order to avoid these in consumer products. And I'm particularly concerned about some of the unintended consequences that are important social justice issues. So one of the unintended consequences of these messages, which I in some ways have referred to earlier with the lifestyle, um, messages is that women blame themselves for their own cancers. And here at Breast Cancer Action, I talk to too many women who talk to me about their breast cancer diagnosis and then move on to confess all of their consumer, you know, so-called sins and, and telling me that they didn't always buy organic and, you know, use nail polish starting at age 13 and, 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 and really blame themselves for their cancers. And I think this is um, one of the very important unintended consequences that we need to really um, look at when we focus on consumer activism. Furthermore, by putting the burden on individuals, we really overlook the unequal access to information and in particular purchasing choices that allow some communities to continue to be exposed. So unfortunately, despite the hopes that companies will change their behavior in response to consumer demand, we know that in typically, the typical response of a company is to simply produce two brand lines. So they introduce a so-called safer product while continuing the traditional product. And what this means is that even if we can avoid a product in our own shopping basket, we really should not be content so long as something that we're concerned about remains on the shelves and in the baskets and bodies of other people. And so any strategy to protect us all, I urge us, must also include the most vulnerable. Um, we need to work together and to take action. If we have concerns about product safety for, our, for ourselves and our families, let us make sure that we look to solutions that protect all families and leave no individual or community exposed. So in closing here on slide 17, yes, you know, may we all have the opportunity to make healthy life choices. Absolutely. May we each eat well and exercise and not smoke and consume alcohol in moderation, if at all. You know, may we all get enough sleep and, and have access to preventive health checks, um, of course, avoiding unnecessary radiation exposure. May we manage our stress. And, you know, at the end of the day, uh, it really doesn't hurt to be wealthy because that is, in fact, the best predictor of health. But even as we strive, you know, to, to have access to these healthy sorts of choices, here on slide 18, let us also demand the systemic change that protects all people's health. Because without comprehensive chemical form, or excuse me, reform, we are basically doomed to an endless game of whack-a-mole with a constantly moving target. And again, Connie will spend some time talking about this at the end. We will never be able to shop our way to good health because so much of our individual body burden of chemicals is simply outside of our control as consumers. We must hold our regulatory system to account. And when we see it failing, we must reject the futile urge to become our own EPA and FDA and instead join together to demand that the government do its job to protect our health, including the vul most vulnerable communities and populations. The sad truth is that today a woman can do all the so-called right things and still get breast cancer. We need to stop blaming women for their own cancers and take action to prevent so many women from getting it in the first place. And so as I conclude my section here on slide 19 and I get ready to hand off to my 
uh, very talented co-presenters, I want to ask why one of the best known symbols in the world, the pink ribbon, does not stand for true primary prevention, for ending to exposures to toxic chemicals that increase the risk of breast cancer. Together, we can work together to build a movement uh, and demand systemic change to end the breast cancer epidemic. I'm on slide 20 now. Thank you for joining us. I'm going to hand it over to Janet, who will talk about the state of research on breast cancer and the environment. Um, information on how to connect with breast cancer action is on the last slide. Um, Thank you, Karuna. Janet? Press, um, press star two to unmute your line if you're muted. Hi, this is Janet. Great, we can hear you now. Okay, great. So uh, thank you so much, Karuna, for that wonderful overview and uh, great discussion of the importance of breast cancer and the importance of paying attention to what we know and acting in the face of what we don't know. I'm going to um, start on uh, my slide two here, which is uh, slide 24 in the overall presentation, by talking about what chemicals, what kinds of chemicals might increase best breast cancer risk and how they might do so. So one of the uh, best understood and best known methods uh, or mechanisms by which a chemical or an exposure such as ionizing radiation might increase risk of any cancer is by damaging DNA. So uh, if you basically if you get accumulate enough mutations in uh, the right or the wrong genes, you can um, end up with turning a normal cell into a tumor cell, which can then progress into cancer. Uh, in breast cancer specifically, as well as a number of other cancers of reproductive and other organs, exposure to hormones and other chemicals that promote the growth of a small tumor into a larger, uh, more aggressive tumor can also make uh, the difference between a, a small tumor that nobody ever notices and a tumor that is a problem that becomes recognized as cancer. So a, an example of that that's probably very familiar to many people is hormone replacement therapy, often abbreviated as HRT. Um, and then there's finally a much subtler and frankly harder to study mechanism in which an exposure very early in life or during a period of breast development such as pregnancy or breastfeeding can lead to changes in the breast that make it more vulnerable much later in life to the development of cancer. So a tragic example of this is the pharmaceutical diethylstilbestrol, or DES, which was prescribed to women when they were pregnant to theoretically prevent miscarriages, which turned out uh, not to be actually something it was useful for, but it did, in fact, increase the risk of many cancers later in life, both for the mothers and their daughters. And um, breast cancer was one of the very strongly elevated cancers in that case. So moving on to slide three, I want to talk about what kind of studies actually help us identify uh, causes of cancer. Um, Generally speaking, you need a, um, a high, well-defined exposure. You need large groups of people that you can measure exposure in. And so, um, and then if you, if you have that kind of group of uh, people to study, you can say, oh, we've got, you know, more disease among the more highly exposed people, less disease uh, um, among the less highly exposed people. Looks like our exposure is correlated with our disease. Uh, but then let's, let's think about what kind of chemicals we're talking about. We're on slide four, we've got um, air uh, chemicals in air pollution, as well as a number of uh, what we generally ta talk about as household chemicals. Uh, these are things like perfluorinated chemicals in uh, nonstick and stain-resistant coatings, as well as uh, chemicals in, in cleaning products and, and other household goods. Specifically for um, the, the PFCs, those kind of coating chemicals, as well as a number of flame retardants and, and um, other chemicals that are 
called persistent organic pollutants. We talk about them generally as house, household exposures, but here in the Arctic, uh, they actually are also pretty prevalent in the environment because they travel on air currents and uh, when they reach the very cold air, precipitate down and then also accumulate in the fat stores of marine animals. So um, stepping back to what kind of studies we can actually use to, to look at cancer causes, one of the most common ways of getting that differentiation between your exposed and your non-exposed groups is in occupational studies. So especially in kind of the middle decades of the 20th century, you had large groups of men working in heavy industry, and they'd be working in the same job for decades. They'd retire, they'd have a company pension, which provided health care, and then you might have an administrator of that health care plan saying, hold on, why, why am I having so many bladder cancer claims? And then they'd go back and look at the job descriptions of the men they were treating. And uh, that was a very clear and strong way of making links between chemicals that mostly men were exposed to and uh, diseases they uh, were diagnosed with later. Generally speaking, women's work histories haven't lent themselves to that kind of study, which has uh, made it a bit harder to identify occupational causes of breast cancer um, in women. There is a, an exception which uh, actually dates back centuries. Uh, it was very early on it was recognized that nuns have a high rate of breast cancer. And this actually led to the study of reproductive factors, which are some of the really most strongly uh, associated and, and best studied factors associated with breast cancer. Nuns, of course, not having children um, and early uh, pregnancy being a protective against breast cancer. We also find um, clear differences between groups that are relatively easy to study. Uh, when In the case of accidents and disasters and other catastrophic exposures, so well-known example of this would be the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, in which uh, many cancers were elevated after those events, uh, including breast cancers, particularly among women who were exposed when they were younger. And then finally, there's the case of pharmaceuticals, where it's, again, relatively well-known who is and isn't taking a prescribed drug. And so, um, but even in the case of hormone replacement therapy, uh, as we move on to the next slide, um, you still had to design exactly the right study to see what the actual effect of hormone replacement therapy was. Many people may be familiar with the story of how uh, hormone replacement therapy was widely prescribed even to women who weren't experiencing symptoms of menopause because it was believed that it was protective against a number of diseases, including breast cancer. However, when uh, scientists finally actually ran a randomized study in which identical or uh, you know, randomly picked groups of women were assigned to take hormone replacement therapy or not, it turned out that, that the pharmaceuticals did in fact have uh, and were in fact increasing the risk, excuse me. And uh, there are a number of other really important considerations when designing a human study. People aren't living in laboratories. We're exposed to many, many chemicals all at the same time at doses that we're not very well able to measure if we're even aware of what we're exposed to. So it's important, uh, as we've seen in studies of the now banned pesticide DDT, that measurements be taken using appropriate tools and appropriate times in a woman's life. Often, if you measure a chemical after diagnosis of breast cancer, you're not going to see the difference between the, the 60-year-old woman with breast cancer and the 60-year-old woman without, because the differences in what they were exposed to when they were a teenager or a young woman aren't going to show up that much later in life. We saw that in studies of DDT. Uh, additionally, 
there are many different kinds of breast cancer. We all have very different biology. So there are some chemicals like PCBs that appear to increase breast cancer risk, specifically in women with uh, certain gene variants that basically in the case of PCBs, they alter how the body handles PCBs specifically, how it breaks them down and, and um, excretes them. So moving on to slide seven, there's a lot we can learn from human studies, but there's a lot we can't. There's, um, like I said, there's chemicals that we're all exposed to, or there's uh, chemicals where people just don't know how they were exposed. So we look to other kinds of evidence, and one of the most important is we look to studies in animals. So a few years ago, some colleagues of mine at Silent Spring identified 216 chemicals that have been found by others to cause mammary tumors in mice and rats. And so uh, you can see on this pie chart, there's a variety of kinds of chemicals. Uh, this largely reflects what has been studied, but it also reflects the, um, the types of chemicals that mostly damage DNA and also have some hormonal effects. So we've got pharmaceuticals, we've got hormones, industrial chemicals, products of combustion. These are all um, important categories that many or all of us are exposed to. Um, so although we've identified hundreds of chemicals just by looking at what causes mammary tumors in rodents, it's important to note that there's probably a lot of chemicals that this kind of study misses because typically the studies that identify tumors in animals don't expose the animals when they're young, when the mammary gland, which is of course analogous to the breast, is developing. So we're likely to miss a lot of those chemicals or exposures that act in that kind of through that kind of mechanism where they disrupt the development of the breast early in life. Um, another thing that people will sometimes say on the, on the other side is, well, rats aren't people. Why are we bothering with this? I, I just want to know about what, what we know to cause cancers in animals, or in people, rather, excuse me. Um, and so I just want to take a minute to note that, yes, uh, the biology is different between, there are bio, important biological differences between, say, rats and humans, but there are also quite a lot of uh, fundamental similarities that make, make uh, the rodent data really very uh, important to pay attention to. And so uh, Karuna mentioned a study that uh, some colleagues and I published just a couple weeks ago, Environmental Health Perspectives. Among other things, we took a look at all of the exposures for which we felt that there was pretty good data or, or you know, pretty, pretty well-conducted studies in humans. So that includes a lot of the things we've already talked about, hormone replacement therapy, DES, in addition to a bunch of other chemical exposures, PAHs, which are polyaromatic hydrocarbons or in um, air pollution and, and from other sources, sleep disruption, ethylene oxide is a gas used to sterilize medical equipment. And um, just taking a look at kind of the, the colors on this chart, you can see, as this is slide eight, that um, that there is pre actually very good agreement between the human and the rodent data. So we don't, in the, in the many, many cases where it's very hard to conduct a human study, it really is important to pay attention to what we know from animal studies. Uh, Janet, well, this is Diana. Yep. I just wanted to let you know you just have a couple of minutes left. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And, uh, in that same paper, uh, we also uh, pulled out 17 categories of chemicals to which most, or in some cases, such as air pollution, pretty much all women are exposed that really should be high priorities for uh, prevention and for further study. And. Uh, I, I want to kind of follow that up by saying that we, we learn a lot from animal studies, just as we learn a lot from human studies, but there's a lot of, as I've noticed, there are limitations. And animal studies, as, as well as human studies, are very expensive. They're very slow. Uh, Karuna noted that we've got 
tens of thousands of chemicals that we have essentially no safety data on. So we can't wait for uh, to conduct, you know, even even the animal tests, which take up to two years for a, uh, or more for a really thorough investigation. So we look to um, we're, there's a lot of evidence, or <laughs> excuse me, there's a lot of efforts to develop faster uh, in vitro tests. So um, typically, when we uh, the, the kind of standard uh, conventional in vitro test, you might picture a test tube or a petri dish, and you grow some cells on that, and you expose them to a chemical, and then you measure some output, or they're sensitive to estrogen. So if they grow a lot, you know that the chemical you expose them to was estrogenic. Um, even that can't quite solve our problem. That's still too slow for the tens of thousands of chemicals that we have really insufficient information about. So we're working, uh, EPA and the National Toxicology Program both have projects to uh, try and develop using um, really high, what they call high throughput tests. So we, um, on slide 10, we've got um, somebody holding these plates, which have uh, many hundreds of basically tiny little test tubes. And uh, they get filled by robots and uh, moved around by robots. So you can run really thousands of tests in a day. And um, this is hopefully going to be the future of, of toxicology testing, hopefully going to tell us a lot about, um, about safety very quickly, but it's still in development. There's still a lot of work being done to try and identify which tests mean what. Um, and so kind of having walked through the many ways that we get information about what chemicals might be influencing breast cancer risk and the the many ways that it's hard to get that information. Um, I know Connie is going to really uh, highlight this, but I want to end by saying that as and as Karuna pointed out about the you know with her slide on the precautionary principle, it's very important that we keep doing the research to identify what might be causing breast cancer, but that we also take what we know now and act on it, and that we don't let the existence of important questions stop us from moving forward, because there will always be questions just by the nature of science. But if we're not using the science to protect ourselves and uh, vulnerable members of our community, then why are we doing it in the first place? And then on my Final slide 11, I have a, a link to our web page, just silentspring.org, and we've got information about all of our research, including that most recent study, as well as um, highlighting here our uh, online tips resource, or exposure reduction tips, uh, Too Close to Home, which just recently launched. So. Thank you, Janet. Thank you. Connie, I Hi. tested out. I tested your link, and it and it looks like it works fine. So I'll just remind all of our participants that you can continue following along with Connie in this document that um, the other presentations were on. But a um, more exciting way to hear to to have her presentation is through the link to her animated version. So that was sent to everyone, and it's available also on the web page. So I'll try to make it clear for everyone what you are looking at at each. Um, Save either by slide number or a visual cue. If you're following along with the animated version, you don't even need to worry about that. Um, so thank you so much. I'm just really delighted to be part of this panel. It's quite um, fun to hear so much um, concurrence over both the challenges and value of the research and the need to act to prevent this disease in a real true primary prevention oriented way. So my goal in my presentation, and I'm going to try to speak, um, I'm going to try to move through this quickly but calmly, 
um, so we have time for questions, is to really talk about what we can do across the span of the personal and political realm. So we sometimes talk about this as a three-legged stool with personal action and public education as one leg, market-based change does change as another, and political action slash laws as the third, and that we really need all three of them to be successful. So I'm going to start with this healthy home tour, but through each of the examples I look at, we'll talk about all three of those elements, sometimes more of one than another. So right now you're going to be looking at a view of the kitchen, and we're going to move into look at some canned foods. So that is slide three if you're following the PowerPoint. And I wanted to talk a little bit about bisphenol A or BPA, which has been largely in the news really since about 2007, 2008. And it was prompted first by a series of studies demonstrating some concerns at very low doses for a whole host of health effects. The science around BPA is booming and complicated. And right now we're really talking a lot in the scientific community about dose and exposure. But in the meantime, we think that we don't need to be biochemists to figure out if this is a risk or not. So we need true reform over our food contact system. So BPA, it is a chemical found in food can linings. It was largely in polycarbonate plastic, so water bottles and baby bottles, although really market forces have changed that almost across the board. There's also in thermal receipts, the kind that print out soundlessly that we get in most retail outlets today. Now the thermal receipts have been replaced in large part and the EPA designed for the environment um, did a, a series of studies to look at this and they found that many of the replacements here for thermal receipts are of concern. They're replaced with things like bisphenol S. Well, that sounds pretty familiar. And it's not surprising that bisphenol S might share some properties with bisphenol A. This underscores the very strong need for ways to ensure that if we get rid of one chemical, we replace it with something that is truly safer. So now what we're watching very carefully is movement in the food can, canning industry away from BPA, but what are they replacing it with? Well, there's a lack of disclosure and a lack of certainty for consumers about what that is in the safety. So in the meantime, right now, some tips are to do things like soaking beans and to choose fresh when possible or frozen vegetables, which are a great alternative. To pick stainless steel water bottles, but ultimately we need to really hold the market accountable and more importantly, change laws. There are a couple of laws in front of Congress right now, in fact, and the one in the House of Representatives would ban BPA from food and beverage containers and of equal importance would require testing of alternatives for safety. That way we don't play that game of whack-a-mole that Corona talked about and have these substitutions that might be as bad or worse. The Senate bill requires labeling that would tell us whether a can has BPA in it or not. Both of these are good moves in the right direction and the alternatives testing piece is really vital. I'm gonna to move to another example, and I think in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip the organic food one for right now, um, but really underscore very briefly that if we think about something like organic food, it has a ripple effect beyond just the decisions we make at home. Choosing organic food has implications for farmers, workers, communities, air, water, and soil. And the other important piece about this is that we can think about organic food or sometimes really locally grown food where we know how it's grown and make changes at the community level. And I know that Bethel, Alaska, which I will be visiting um, next week, actually has a summertime farmer's market. They're popping up all over the country, even in places where you wouldn't expect them. And that's amazing. Perfluorinated compounds are of real importance for people living in Arctic settings. 
these are the chemicals used to make nonstick coatings for pans and also in stain resistant clothing and fabrics. And unfortunately, these are one of the chemicals that concentrate in Arctic settings that drift into those areas. And so it's very important that we take control of this situation. And certainly there are tips we can do at home, like skipping nonstick pots and pans and switching to things like cast iron or stainless steel. And also installing in-home water filters to get some of those chemicals out of our drinking water. However, without real chemicals policy reform, we're gonna end up with uncontrolled exposures in Arctic settings and also in downstream um, communities from processing plants that produce these, which is very, very true in areas of the US like Kentucky and um, Ohio. Moving now to the living room. So this is slide number seven, our flame retardants. And that's all I'm gonna talk about here, although there's more we could cover. Flame retardants are found in both our furniture and also in our electronics in our home. They're often comprised of compounds similar to van P PCBs, so polybrominated diphenyl ethers are one example here. And what these share is they're made up of bromine or chlorine. We also heard the word chlorine in, uh, um, we also heard fluorine in the perfluorinated compounds. All of those share some similar chemical pro properties and they also all concentrate in Arctic climates. This is an area too where with flame retardants, we have some regrettable substitutions happening. So for instance, a lot of the PBDEs are being taken out of consumer products, but in some cases they're being replaced with related compounds based on the chlorine molecule that were actually banned from children's pajamas in the 70s. Well, I don't know about you, but I really don't wanna see something that was banned from my pajamas when I was a little kid showing up now on my sofa. Again, this is another area where these concentrate in Arctic environments, meaning that we need to take control of this at both the consumer level, but also with laws that make market-based changes something that become across the board and a known thing. In the meantime, some tips we can take are to wash our hands frequently, that washes away household dust where these things accumulate, to vacuum with a HEPA filter to capture dust and eliminate what we're breathing and touching, to buy furniture made of wool, cotton, and other legacy fibers, which all reduce um, the need for flame retardants because they burn more slowly on their own. But really we need to aim for safer alternatives. I'm going to skip cleaning products because they share a lot in common with cosmetics and personal care products. But the big difference is that cleaning products have even less disclosure than do personal care products. So both of these have a disclosure issue related to fragrance, which can stand in for dozens of unlabeled chemicals. We don't know what we're buying. We don't know what we're using. And these can contain endocrine disruptors like synthetic musks and phthalates. Both personal care products and cleaning products can contain other chemicals of concern like parabens, triclosan, alkyl phenols, et cetera. And when we're talking specifically about personal care products, we're talking about bath products, skin care, hair care, and more. So some tips here to go simple, to use fewer products with fewer ingredients, to choose companies that fully disclose fragrance and to pay special attention to kids' products. If we go back to household cleaners, choosing companies that actually label their products is a good first step. But we need some laws to fix this. And in front of Congress right now is the Safe Cosmetics and Personal Care Products Act, which would do all of the things that you see here. It calls for a phase out of the worst chemical, chemicals and some safety assessments as well. Also full labeling of ingredients, very, very key here. And consideration of the vulnerable populations when making the safety assessments above. The last example, as promised, is that I will talk about radiation exposure. 
and this is slide 12, if you're following there. The problem is that radiation exposure per person has doubled since 1980. This is largely due to a 600% increase in medical radiation, especially from CT scans, fluoroscopy, and other very high dose radiation. Now there, are, this is a very, you know, personal and, and deep situation because sometimes these are life-saving procedures. So it's important to really talk with your doctor about what's needed and what alternatives exist and what doses are safest. But with regard specifically to breast cancer, a very uh, recent study in 2012 found that diagnostic radiation exposure before age 30 increased risk of breast cancer among women with BRCA mutation. So these are women who already have a very elevated risk of breast cancer and who often are getting screened quite frequently starting at early, early ages. Now this study also found that more radiation exposure led to a greater increase in breast cancer risk. So it's really important here quite specifically to think about alternative screening modalities for those women who already have such high risk and a very serious need for screening. So ultimately, prevention is the key to reducing the burden of breast cancer. This is the conclusion on slide 13 of a committee that met for over two years to talk about breast cancer in the environment. They ultimately determined that it was imperative to prioritize prevention through looking at interagency communication and coordination about how to do this, how best to research it, and how best to make policy changes that would be health protective. Now, ultimately, we need to regulate chemicals for all of their uses. So if you go to slide 15, we can see that there is this bit of a quandary with regard to our policy because we have at least four agencies with at least 11 different offices regulating our chemicals in the United States. I could go into a lot of detail here, but there are at least some classes of chemicals that every one of these offices has a say in the regulation over, which means that unless those 11 offices are talking to each other, we're missing that idea of true reform of our chemicals policy system. So one starting point is reform of the Toxic Substances Control Act. This is the law that governs the most chemicals in the United States, but we know that if we go to slide 17, it has been largely unsuccessful. So as Karuna talked about, this was passed in 1976. It's gone 38 years without updating. If we think about the 38 years of that time and the scientific advances that have been made, they're substantial. The idea of endocrine disruption, and many other complexities, early life exposure, those are all within those 38 years, but the law has not adjusted. In addition, 62,000 chemicals were grandfathered in with no safety review, and now there are 84,000 chemicals registered for commerce. There have been a number of bills put forth in front of Congress, and the most recent ones are quite concerning. So we are not only often trying to pass good laws, but we're trying to keep the laws that might reinstitute these same problems or make them worse from passing. So you can probably connect with any one of our organizations to talk more about this and help get your voice out to protect against worse laws. So I just wanna talk about, I'm gonna to jump to um, slide 19. Occupation, Janet talked a little bit about the benefit of occupational studies, but we know that women in occupations have been largely understudied, partly because of when and how they've entered the workforce, but also because of their numbers and because we've also simply done less research on women in general. This is starting to change and it's imperative that we look at women's occupational exposures. So there are 
several areas where this is happening right now, and you can get in touch with me to learn more. But one is that Janet and I are both working on a study of women firefighters in San Francisco. And when we work with them, we're looking at exposures they can't control that occur through their occupation. And then also talking to them about the ones at home that they can. So again, I wanna revisit this idea of the three-legged stool. Public education can go so far. It can help us make changes in our everyday lives that do reduce our burden. And since we know that it's mixtures of exposures that lead to risk, every little bit helps. Markets can also change. And the great thing about markets is they can change pretty fluidly, pretty quickly in response to consumer demand. But sometimes they can also change back or they can pick alternatives that may not be better. So ultimately, to protect everybody, we have to pass true chemical policy reform across all those agencies I posted on that one slide and move this forward. So I could give some time to the various tips on slide 21. However, I think that we're out of time. So I'm just gonna let you read these. Happy to talk with you more about them. And you can contact me on slide 22 with any questions. Thank you, Connie. And I would just like to ask all of our speakers, are you able to stay um, a maximum of 10 minutes over so that we can field some questions? You all did an amazing job of covering an incredible amount of material in a short time. And I know that you're gonna be able to give expanded presentations in Alaska next week. So I encourage all of you in Alaska who are able to attend to go to one of those events. But I just wanna know, can I, can I have the call go over a little bit to take a few questions? Certainly. I'm fine with that. I'm fine as well. Okay. So let's go ahead and um, open the lines for questions. If you'd like to ask a question, again, we just really have time probably only for one or two, but if you'd like to ask a question, please press star two to unmute your line. And if you could um, state your name and affiliation, that would be great. And be brief so that we can get to a few. Thanks so much. This is Marnie Glazer calling. And I have a question. I, I Unless I missed something when I jumped up to take care of the stove, I didn't hear anything at all about radio frequency radiation as being any kind of concern on your list for breast cancer. Is that not on your radar? Um, this is Janet. Uh, it's, you know, non-ionizing non -ionizing radiation, excuse me, uh, is something that has been really tough to study, and um, it's so many of the studies performed are by seem to be by somebody with who's convinced ahead of time of the answer one way or the other, um, and the exposures are so hard to characterize that um, it's it's just a tricky one. Basically, is is um, where I have to leave it with that. I don't know if Connie so or Karuna has. Yeah, this is this is Connie, and I, I would concur that it is um, a tricky area to study and a complex question. Um, the findings related to breast cancer have been very mixed, but largely falling on the end where um, it does not appear to be as significant a concern as many others, if it is an issue at all. Um, it's difficult to study in part because the doses are constantly changing. And of course, we know that breast cancer is a long latency disease. Um, we do review the various studies um, on our website under our clear science section. Um, so if you search for non-ionizing radiation, which is what this is usually called um, in the scientific community, you can learn more about the various studies and why we um, say, yeah, this is tricky. Thank you for your, for your question, and we have time for another one. Again, star two to unmute your line. Hi, I have a question about, this is Jennifer Eden in New York City. I have a question about um, the recommendations then regarding mammograms and, and, and well, mammograms, basically. Is it still considered something that should be done with a sort of maybe a lack of anything else to do to sort of detect tumors or things of that nature that might be there? Yeah. Um, this is 
Karuna. So um, there's a we could do an entire teleconference on that right. topic. Um, I think the long and the short of it is that when you look at the growing body of evidence, and particularly a number of studies and um, reports and perspectives that have come out this spring, including the Canadian mammography study, which was a randomized um, controlled study in Canada with nearly 100,000 women followed over 25 years. And the results of that study is that for middle-aged women in their 40s and 50s, mammography screening did not produce um, results in terms of overall survival. So women who were screened did not live longer than women who were not screened. Meanwhile, there were a whole host of harms that are a company screening, um, such that more than 20%, you know, more than one in five women who are diagnosed with cancer are estimated to be overtreated. Um, and so that means, you know, again, they're bearing the physical, financial, emotional brunt of treatment without uh, benefit. So, um, you know, there's a lot to say about the topic, but I think there's certainly important that women understand um, the limitations of mammography and the harms when they make their decisions. Okay. Um, this is Wiesa in Maine. I wondered if I could comment on that last question. Yeah, go ahead. Just please try to be brief because we are going to have to wrap up here. Sure. I just recommend that women investigate thermography. I am familiar with it, and I've seen at least two women by thermography have something that was not there on mammogram, and when they cleaned up their living style and boosted their immune system, it disappeared, and obviously there's not enough numbers, but it looks very promising to me, and there are MDs involved with it. So one of the things that we need um, across the board is that there's been a lot of money invested in, this is Connie, mammography um, research to determine, you know, in a systematic way, the things that, like Karuna just, just commented on, the, the limitations of it and where it is effective among women over 50, um, but not as much in younger women. And we don't have those same kinds of studies for thermography. Um, certainly, um, MRIs are good at detecting some, and that's what they're using in lieu of mammography in the UK for women with BRCA. Uh, mutation. So that's one modality. Of course, it's very expensive. And um, also ultrasound for women 40 to 50. But again, we don't have the systematic kind of research on the same scale, which is imperative. So thanks so much, Connie, for raising this. This is Karuna. And what I, I'm, I can feel myself really holding back here because I don't want to derail this really important topic on breast cancer and the environment into um, a, a breast cancer screening conversation. Um, I want to underscore your point that the issue here is that we, it's actually a fundamental issue of the philosophy of early detection. And so, in fact, I think, you know, you kind of referenced some older data, which, um, you know, was considered um, useful a number of years ago. What we've seen is that this isn't just an issue of age. This isn't just, you know, the question of do women in their 40s get breast screenings or not. This is an issue of efficacy of screening programs, period. That is, mm -hmm. do we want to subject the general population at average risk to, to breast cancer screenings, um, knowing that about a fifth of breast cancer diagnoses are going to be um, overdiagnoses and produce overtreatments mm -hmm. when there are not benefits in terms of overall survival? Um, and so I think, you know, I kind of could feel myself holding back and, and fundamentally, you know, the balance of harm and benefit, you know, while the numbers may change ever so slightly in terms of mammography or thermography or ultrasound or MRI, we need to really, you know, the current data is really questioning the efficacy of these early detection programs, period. Now, that's for women at average risk. These are screening programs, yeah. and that has to be separated from surveillance programs for women who have had breast cancer and for women who are at extremely high risk because of a BRC mutation, right? And so it's really important that we're separating out the tool from the programs and screening 
is different from surveillance, is different from using these tools to confirm a diagnosis, right? And so, um, you know, again, the Canadian study really showed that, yes, breast cancer awareness is important and um, access to high quality healthcare is important. That's really where the differentiator lies. It's not in these screening programs, it's in the ability to access treatments and medical care. So the lead time offered through screening appears to not be beneficial at this point where what really is making the difference is that women um, ha are able to go and, and you know, get a lump checked and get appropriate treatments. Thank you, thank you, Karuna. I um, I'm sorry to have to to wrap this call up, but I just want to be respectful of everyone's time, and I want to really encourage you um, to come out to the event uh, in Anchorage on Wednesday, June 4th. That's next Wednesday at 6:30 p.m. There'll be a reception, and the panel um, talk will begin at seven, and that's at the Lusac Library. And our guests, all three, um, will also be in. Homer, Bethel, and Fairbanks on Thursday, June 5th. Actually, I don't think all three will be in all three locations, but um, you will be able to, to see um, them speak in those communities as well on Thursday, June 5th. So I want to thank each and every one of you um, for joining us today, for participating in this call. I want to thank our speakers for their time. I want to let everyone know that there will be a recording available um, of the call so that you can listen again or share with your friends and colleagues. And if you'd like further details about the events, you can find them on our website at akaction.org, or you can call our office in Anchorage at 907-222-7714. We really hope you can join us um, for these events. And we, a lot of community action on toxics would also, yes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This is Pam at Alaska Community yes. Action on Toxics. And I just wanted to remind everyone that these events that are happening in Alaska next week with our wonderful speakers are sponsored by and made possible by the Alaska Run for Women. So we want to thank them for making this opportunity available to us. Thank you, Pam. That was just what I was about to say, but I'm really glad that you mentioned it as well. Um, that we are um, very happy to have the support of, of those fun, um, funders in bringing Karuna, Janet, and Connie to Alaska. So thank you to everyone so much for joining us today, and we hope to see you at the events next week. Thanks so much for the opportunity. It's great to be thank with you. Yes, thank yes, you. Yes, thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> The organizer has disconnected and this conference will continue for 60 minutes.